All right. All right, we're ready to begin. Who'd like to go first? Adam? I've been hearing extraordinary frustration from municipalities. You know, a lot of folks in that room are folks from areas where their friends and neighbours have voted Conservative for 50 years. And they've been very clear that this batch of Conservatism is not the Peter Lougheed or even the Ralph Klein that they voted for. They're very angry, they're very frustrated with this government because this government has treated municipalities with contempt. It does not have any respect for people as democratically elected officials, and it's tried to put its thumb on its scale to ensure that in the next election, only people who like the government will be elected. That's fundamentally anti-democratic, and it's fundamentally insulting to the hardworking people in this room. Also, it's not gonna work. Every single time provincial government attempts to interfere in municipal politics, it backfires on them. Uh, and I have no doubt it will backfire on them again in 2025. But that was kind of the first thing. We're gonna mess with your elections. We're gonna to listen to conspiracy theorists and not allow you to count the votes using the machines you bought 20 years ago to count votes, costing you an extra few hundred thousand dollars or millions of dollars on every election. So messing with the elections was one thing. Putting provincial party, political parties that nobody asked for in Calgary and Edmonton is a great tell because they only care about getting rid of the councils in Calgary and Edmonton because they don't think that they have, they, they think they have too much power and they disagree with them too much. Those are democratically elected people. Jyoti Gondek, like her or don't like her, she got more votes in Calgary than every UCP MLA combined. And so people were offended, first, that they were trying to interfere in municipal elections. Second, especially in the larger municipalities, they were offended that the province will no longer allow them to talk to the federal government and get funding for projects that are important to their local priorities. This goes as far as saying people at the University of Lethbridge will have to run their research grants through the provincial government now. And so this has affected people across every province. Further, they are offended that Jason Kenney stopped paying half of the province's taxes, leaving holes in the budget of every single municipality that has a provincial courthouse or other provincial um, provincial owned buildings in the municipality and the premier today seems surprised by that um, and instead of taking responsibility for it she said ask my finance minister if he'll give you back the money that's a huge issue and the fact that she was not briefed on that before talking to the municipalities was pretty shocking they are angry about the increased crime and social disorder and lack of investment in housing by the provincial government um, that is showing up in greater crime and visible poverty on the streets of almost every community in the province. So fundamentally, this government has always relied on municipal councillors to be their, their unthinking allies. And I have never heard such hostility towards a provincial government from local elected officials than I've heard this year and this week. Sorry, that was a very long answer. You know, here's the biggest challenge I have with this government is that they, rather than like a normal government would, consult, send out a draft, make a decision, do so publicly, answer questions. They love to release major policy that will change people's lives in dribs and drabs at members only town halls with Take Back Alberta or in this case to the Alberta municipalities. And in fact, I was just in meetings with municipalities over the last couple of days where they said, we have no idea what the Premier is doing on an Alberta provincial police. You know, Bill, on the one hand, she took it out of the mandate letter for her minister. On the other hand, they passed a bill calling sheriffs police, but they didn't fund it, and they didn't talk about how um, the sheriffs might actually operate in a big role. And then today, much to the surprise of everyone in the room, including the Alberta sheriffs, I understand, she announced that Alberta sheriffs will open their own dispatches, their own detachments, uh, and that municipalities will have the right to keep the RCMP or have an Alberta sheriff's de detachment take over. 
Nobody's ever talked about it. Nobody knows about it. Nobody knows how much it'll cost. Nobody knows what the advantages and disadvantages are. And I would suspect that the RCMP and the sheriffs in the room also had no idea what she was talking about. And now, because she's forgotten, she's not a radio host and she's the premier, hundreds of people will be dispatched to spend millions of dollars to try and figure out what the heck she meant and make it happen. That is not how a normal government works. Your predecessor said the NDP would stop the provincial police force in its tracks. Is that, is that how you feel about it? Is that what you would do? Every study that has been done on an Alberta provincial police has shown that it will cost hundreds of millions of dollars more to the Alberta taxpayer. Certainly there are big concerns about rural crime. There are concerns about the RCMP's uh, dispatch model and the RCMP's ability to respond. But rather than try and fix those in a cost-effective manner that, by the way, is subsidized by the federal government, taking on an Alberta provincial police and starting from scratch is the height of financial lunacy. Uh, it'll just cost so much money and it's not at all clear that it will solve any of the problems. Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. I need a, an adult to tell me when I can speak. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, just kind of on a similar vein with the police, uh, what do you make of the announcement of the move by the government this week? Um, they're setting up police committees or commissions in, um, <clears throat> in different small towns and municipalities, kind of alongside uh, city council but separate from city council. I mean, how, how do you see that shaping yeah. out? How do you see that working? Who ultimately is going to have the authority in those situations? You know, citizen oversight of policing is crucial. Nobody wants to live in a society where the mayor can say who the police should arrest. And you've got to have citizen oversight, and the police commission model works really well in larger municipalities. The problem is this government doesn't trust anybody. They don't trust anybody who's not them. So they've already messed up with the police commissions in Calgary and Edmonton by appointing provincial representatives to those councils. And when the premier was asked about this power grab away from citizens to the province, she said, well, we could have taken them all. You're lucky we only took a few. Um, so ultimately, yes, you need citizen oversight, but you have to trust people. And this is the challenge we have, so many parts of this government, is people recognize the need for reform, but they don't trust a government that doesn't trust anybody else to actually get it right. And on something completely different, um, we, we were asking the Premier today about the issue of vote tabulators. Obviously, Alberta municipalities members voted overwhelmingly uh, to be able to keep using those. But the Premier said, essentially, I want to go back to the old-fashioned way, hand counting is more reliable. And when she was pressed for specifics about where it did not work and when it was, was not functional, one example she pointed to was in Banff, Canada, Act 5th in the last provincial election when Rand Rosen thought that she had won and went to the podium to give a victory speech. But then, in the end, Sarah won that one, mm -hmm. uh, if you recall. By a pretty healthy margin, as I recall. So, so is there a problem with Using vote no, existing. no, no, there's no problem with using vote tabulators. And let's be clear, vote tabulators are not voting machines. They're like the things when you were in school and you used your HB pencil to fill out the answers and the scanning machine counted the answers. That's all they are. And we only started using them in Calgary in 2018 for the Olympics referendum. But there are places in Alberta that have been using these for decades. And so... You know, the challenge is, what problem are you trying to solve here? And what other problems will result? The other problems that will result is that it's way, way, way more expensive to count by hand. So two things will happen. Number one is it will take way later to actually get the results on election night, but also that it will cost a lot more. So one mid-sized city told me they estimate their election will now cost $300,000 more to run. Um, in a city like Edmonton or Calgary, we're probably looking at a number into the millions, and they're not paying for that. And so the real question is, what problem are they trying to solve? And the answer is pretty straightforward. I mean, what a strange answer from the Premier. Somehow hand counting will lead to fewer close races or fewer candidates jumping the gun and making a speech before the final results are in. It's not going to help. In fact, it'll make it much later at night. Um, the real thing here is she's listening to conspiracy theorists from the U.S. who think that somehow vote tabulators can be hacked. Here's the thing. The vote tabulators are not connected to a network. All they do is count. Uh, they are not voting machines. You cannot hack them. 
Um, and if they really wanted to fix the problem, what they would do is they would give provisions in the Municipal Government Act to hand count votes in a recount when the vote is very close, which the Municipal Government Act currently did not allow when you have vote tabulating machines. That was a loophole. But that's easy to fix. Um, and she's just listening to conspiracy theorists and clearly has not thought this through at all. Michelle. It is that much, eh? Yeah, that's okay. estimated. Um, and I think Jody Gondek said... 1.3. Yeah, 1.3. Yeah. She, that's a preliminary estimate. And I know the city of Red, Red Deer here, they said it's about three and a half times the, uh, the cost of the last election. Um, I mean, given that the province is determined, bound and determined to do this... Should they, they should pay for it. That's what I was just going to ask. Simple as that. If you're going to put costs onto municipalities, pay for it. If you're going to light $800, billion, $800 million on fire in the city of Calgary, pay for it. Don't expect property taxpayers to have increased property taxes to pay for your whims. I guess the other issue that um, both Red Deer and, and uh, Edmonton noted in their um, reports is staffing, right? Because I think it's hard enough to get election workers in. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to get a whole lot more to do uh, that kind of counting. Yeah. Does that raise concerns for you as well? Yeah, I know. Let's, let's be very clear. Those numbers feel abstract, 2.3 million, 1.3 million, 300,000 here and there. What that means is you have to hire a whole bunch more people who are willing to work an 18-hour shift because you have to stay in the room and stay there until very, very, very late at night hand-counting the ballots. The campaigns will need more scrutineers watching the counting of the ballots. Uh, and it's just a human resources problem. So if you've been to vote lately, you will know that, bless them, the community-minded people who work as poll clerks are getting older. And not a lot of them are getting replaced. And so where in the world are we going to find these people when people are working, they're struggling to make ends meet, who can take an entire weekday off for 18 hours, get paid very little, um, just because they believe in democracy? You know, I, I wish that there were tons of those people. There are not. I've been speaking to small town mayors, small village mayors over the last 24 hours, and one of the concerns that they have with your leadership is you formerly represented one of the largest cities in the province of Calgary, so you don't represent small town Alberta. What's your message to those small town mayors to ensure that you, they're not going to be left behind if the NDP do form the next government? Leaders? We haven't had a premier uh, from small town Alberta in a real long time. And in fact, uh, I can think of the last mayor of Calgary who became premier, who worked very, very hard to make sure that he was representing people in communities of every size. And that's certainly what I pledge to do. I have spent the summer traveling the highways and byways of Alberta, going to all kinds of small town festivals. I look forward to going to more and more of them. Hey Vulcan, I'm looking at you for Star Trek days. Um, but I really uh, need to understand the rest of the province better. And the fact that we've got some time between now and the next election, will really give me a chance to prove myself to those folks. Just on that note, there is going to be an upcoming by-election whenever it will be called. The NDP have named their candidate, the UCB have named their candidate. In your leadership announcement press conference, the, after you won the leadership, you said you didn't really know Lethbridge that well. I'm getting it to know it better. It's been three months. Yeah. Do you know the issues that are facing them? And yeah, I'm starting to, and I'm really excited that we have a candidate in Lethbridge West who is a true son of Lethbridge, um, who has been working with seniors and in the nonprofit sector for many years, who served two terms on city council. I think that's exactly the kind of candidate that Lethbridgers, Lethbridgeians, Lethbridgertons, I don't know, people of Lethbridge um, have been asking for. And uh, I'm really excited about that because I love that we're giving them a choice of someone who is truly rooted in that community because the community it's you know it's far from Edmonton and sometimes it's forgotten now that said I have had the chance to get to know Lethbridge much better um, I've got the chance to really understand some of the issues in the city uh, like everywhere in Alberta they are concerned about health care uh, they're concerned about education there's a particular concern in Lethbridge around public disorder crime and safety where the numbers are amongst the worst in the province and very bad in Canada so these are things we need to focus on and help people understand that over the five years of UCP government these issues have gotten much worse in Lethbridge but better is possible anyone else 
terms of, you know, I know that <coughs> Brad Street twice as big as a coffee shop or some other. Have you decided that you're chief of staff there? I don't have one. Are you going to have one? I don't think so. Is that right? Yeah, we're trying a new, this is so inside baseball. I know. Oh, really legislative is. reporters. <laughs> Um, I'm not using the terms that often are used in federal government or that Jason Kenney used, which is chief of staff and principal secretary, but um, we actually have two executive directors um, of the caucus staff, uh, one kind of more internally focused and one more externally focused, uh, and I'm really excited about it. They're two really great people with tons of experience, and the caucus staff as a whole uh, it's been a great pleasure for me these last three months getting to learn about these folks. We've done a lot of kind of restructuring, but I think we've got great people in great roles right now, and we're ready to move forward as session comes to pass in the next month. Questions? Oh, can I actually ask a third question? I never leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make you leave. No, no comments. Um, I'm getting a little sweaty, though. Yeah, it's hot under here. Drink? No, I'm fine. I wanted to ask about LGFS. Sure. Upper municipalities have been calling on this uh, provincial government to increase. Oh, I missed that line in my speech. That's what I was about to say. Yeah. Would you actually increase it by the one billion up to one billion dollars that the Alberta municipalities is asking for? And if not, why not? I mean, look, at the end of the day, Alberta is growing so quickly. Municipal infrastructure needs to keep up, and it's impossible to rely on the residential and commercial property tax to pay for that infrastructure. So when I was mayor, we created the city charters for Calgary and Edmonton, along with the fiscal framework. The problem is that the Kenny government massively defunded the fiscal framework. And the roads across Alberta are in disrepair. As we know, a lot of work needs to be done on water lines. Uh, so it's really important for us to increase the infrastructure funding. But here's the problem. When I first became mayor, there was something called the MSI, the Municipal Sustainability Initiative, which was the largest funding for municipalities ever. And that came from Premier Stelmack. But immediately, they started stretching it out and reducing the amounts and reducing the amounts and reducing the amounts to the point where the fiscal framework now, you know, I don't have the stats right in front of me, but I believe that we are paying less in the fiscal framework to municipalities today, and I'm looking around the room for the Alberta municipalities people to tell me I'm wrong, but I believe we're paying less today than we were paying in 2008 with a province that is massively larger, uh, that has massively higher infrastructure needs. It's ridiculous. So, you know, I haven't done the math and I haven't costed out exactly how much more, but I trust the Alberta municipalities number is not inflated. That is the number that is actually needed, and that's what we've got to find. All right, thanks everybody.